So welcome to Wednesday's Wisdom. We're in for a treat. I'm super excited to be here with you. And I'm Patty Mercado, just in case you don't know me. And this evening we are going to have some fantastic inspiration from the wonderful Michael Paul Smith. But before that, we have some um, ways to center ourselves and prepare for that time together. So our practitioner this evening is Pamela Brock and she will open us up with prayer after our chant. Pamela will be available after the service for about 15 minutes, and she will meet with you in the Tranquility Room. Yes. She will meet with anyone who would so desire to have the powerful presence of Pamela and prayer in the Tranquility Room. So, without any further ado, we'll have a chant. Michael has graciously offered to lead us in it, and then Pamela will open us up with prayer. join me in affirmative prayer and, and I am simply staying in that beautiful peaceful moment right here right now that place of knowing the truth and what I know to be absolutely true is that there is only one thing one essence one energy one mind one perfect creative source of all that one source be it called God or Allah or Buddha or Frank or Harry Sally that one thing Universal energy is, is life force. It is the intelligence that has its life in and as and of and through each and every one of the beloveds in this room this evening. And so I know, therefore, automatically, that each of us is absolutely perfect. Each of us is eternal. Each, is, each of us is health, vitality, life, love, and so much more, wisdom. I declare and know for each of us this evening that it is a time of love, of sharing, of perfection. And I'm so grateful for this. I am grateful for this moment in time, this moment, this eternal moment in time. I'm grateful for the beloveds in this room. I am grateful for Michael Paul and Patty and everyone. I'm grateful for the love. I know that it's already done since I've spoken my word. So I simply release my word into that one perfect creative mind that always says yes to everything that's put into it. I let it go, I let it be, as together we say, and, and so, so it is. is. <clears throat> and so it's um, my happy, happy pleasure to share a quick demonstration. And I suppose the safest thing to do, it's always self-disclosing, it's always safest to share one of my own. And so, uh, being of that, of a certain age, you know, I always have to have the, the, the yearly tests and so forth. And so, every so often I get a call back and, and 
I always know that everything is fine, but it's, it's, it's still rather scary. So I sit and I do um, prayer for myself. And um, it always turns out fine. And this time it just turned out fine. That's what she said. Okay, fine. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. What a great reminder that we can pray for ourselves and know the truth for ourselves all the time. Well done. So, uh, Reverend Judy, as she was hustling out the doorway, handed me this beautiful book, B, written by James Dillett Freeman. And she said, here, read this. So I'm following directions and sharing with you this beautiful inspiration that Reverend Judy wanted to share with us. Love is the power that links the lonely islands of men's souls, beaten by icy separating seas of ignorance and fear and circumstance. Love is the power that links us all in God, as all the islands are linked in the earth. Yet love is not a chain. Love is complete. The river runs into the sea, and its waters mingle with the waters of the sea. The sea is not the river, and the river is not the sea. Yet, who can separate one from the other? O oh God of love, you are the sea, and we are a river flowing to the sea. Who shall say which is the river and which is the sea? So beautiful. And such a, a beautiful passage to lead us into Michael's message this evening that reminds us about the power of love, the completeness of love, the joy of love, the beauty of love. And so it's with great love and appreciation that I turn this over to you, Michael, and welcome you to the platform as our speaker and inspirer of the evening. So let's all welcome Michael Paul Smith. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. So, um, you guys are such a wonderful group, and you love to eat, so I really like you a lot. Um, but tonight um, is a very special uh, subject for me, and uh, I'd like to share this song that I found from uh, Wasutara, Washintara is his name, and it's, uh, the title is You Can't Stop Love. So I wanted to start with that. Um, uh, this evening. Oh, <laughs> 
your love run free right over the ocean right across the stream of my talk. It's, it's, uh, it's a great subject for me. I call it all love. And uh, I'm just going to throw out three words. Heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, and mind. It's interesting the position that they, they take. The heart, the soul, and the mind. So let me just tell you, I uh, one day as I was sitting in my spiritual way, uh, after a meditation, I, I, I thought to myself, I said, uh, you know, I have a question. What is the most powerful energy force in the universe? Every now and then I get a scientific thought like that. <laughs> and I thought, uh, I just pose a question to you. What is the most energy force in the universe? And I pondered and I thought, and I said, I think it's love. And, um, and I thought, well, if, if it's love, why don't we invest more time in this discovery of it? You know, if I was an economist, I would go to school and attempt to get a bachelor's of science degree in economics. And if I was fortunate, I would probably transfer to some other major university for a master's degree in economics, and hopefully end up at Oxford in the PhD program for economics. Or if I was a chemist, I would strive to get a bachelor's of science in organic chemistry, perhaps, and so on and so forth. And I said, but these things are not the most powerful force in the universe. And I said, what is wrong with us as human beings? Why are we not investing in that which is, possesses the most power? And so that drove me to, to really belabor the idea. And so my goal tonight, uh, in, in this time that I have with you, is to invite you to embody more love in every aspect of your life. I believe love will awaken every part of the individual experience for a more loving and beautiful life. So, how does love awaken us more in our lives? That's the question, how do we do it? I, uh, I, was, I thought as a child, uh, some of us are fortunate enough to have love demonstrated uh, as a young child. And some of us are not as fortunate to have experienced love demonstrated to us as a young child. So I said, well, how do I get to the point where I can uh, express more love? And so I said, the first place must be to start with the heart. Because the heart seems to be such a powerful uh, organ in the body. And so I went and I researched that. I said, your heart is the most powerful organ in your body far more powerful than the mind. The heart controls feelings, compassion, forgiveness, understanding, generosity, empathy, caring, and of course, love. The heart is a domain of human intimacy, activating affection, warmth, nurturing, friendship, and familiarity. The heart is a simple focal point of divine love, which is our divinity. If you'll say it with me right now, I love my heart. Can we say that together? I love, I love my, my heart. heart. Oh, it's good. Some of you actually put your hand on your heart, and that, that's very powerful. Let's try it again. I love, I love my, my heart. heart. Love is what we all crave the most. It is what we give the most to make a difference in the world. 
The heart is that seed of our divine and spiritual essence. When our hearts are open, we are able to connect with all of life in all of its vast forms. In our heart, we are endowed with the capacity to feel joy, unity, passion, tenderness. An open heart stimulates and activates the highest aspiration, our highest ideas, and brings out the best in us. When I was in middle school, I, uh, I was having difficulty with math. I wasn't particularly my favorite subject. And so one of uh, the tutors there said, well, Michael, you have to learn to like math. You, in fact, you have to learn to love math to do well in it. And I said, oh, man, that's, that's, I tried it. And I actually got a B in that class. So <laughs> that was my first experience at loving something enough that it would transform that experience. When your heart is open, you realize that you have the potential to have a truly extraordinarily magical and miraculous life. These sounds like platitudes and words that, oh, uh, they only exist in the lexicon of, of, of a vocabulary. But they are actually words that we can eternalize and express uh, through love. The power of love takes us beyond our mortal self and reminds us who we really are a magnificent spiritual being. When you move into the power of love, you move into the power of miracles. Who would not like to perform miracles in today's world? We, yes, I mean, absolutely. Miracles would be great. We, one of the most uh, features of, of, of reading some of the uh, uh, traditional Christian uh, uh, texts in the Bible is uh, the performance of the Christ. He performed miracles constantly. And I said, well, a friend of mine said, yo, it's not so difficult to walk on water, Michael. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He says, I walk on water every time I take a shower. <laughs> and then, so I said, well, that's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. And the more we move into the power of healing, uh, of love, it has a way of manifesting and, and healing our bodies. You become the light of the planet. I want you to touch your heart again with me. This is our power. And say, I awaken to love. I awaken to love. Once again, I awaken to love. Once again, I awaken to love. Uh, take a moment to, to feel that. Your heartbeat. They say our, our heart beats to the rhythm of the universe. That's how powerful we are as, as creatures of this planet. So how do we describe love? It's kind of a difficult thing to put our hands on. You know, if I was to grab a bunch of air, I know it exists, but I really cannot feel the texture of it. I really can't smell the, what is the sense of air, so, you know, through the five senses. But we know it exists in a most powerful way. So how do we describe love? I, I went to look, uh, to the, the educators uh, extraordinaire, who were the Greeks, of course. And under the perceptive eye of Socrates, he had eight types of love. That's right, you heard me correctly. Eight types of love. And I didn't know that I knew about three at the time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the list with you tonight. Uh, first, of course, is eros, which is exotic love, passionate, sensual love. The next is philia, the love of friends, uh, brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Storge, the love between parent and child. Ludus is a playful, uncommitted love. Probably when we were 14, we had a crush on somebody, that type of love where you're, you're silly and giggly and, and you sock them and show them how much you like them, you know? And then there's mania, which is obsessive love. And then there's pragma, enduring love. Pragma will be the love of uh, someone who's been married for maybe 50 years with, to the same person. <laughs> and they still love one another. So, so that was great. And then there's philautia, philautia, 
the love of oneself. Philadelphia is the love of oneself. And then, of course, agape, which we know that's the, they have great music there, of course. <laughs> and I would add another type of love to this as well. I would say divine love. And divine love, uh, to me, is that love that expresses itself in all ways, at all times, at everyone. And it manifests, it's a manifestation, manifestation of our divineness. So this divine love, love in action. My first experience uh, with divine love, I'll share with you, was uh, my metaphysical mentor. I was 14 years old. And little did I know that my father had bequeathed me to one of his best friends who had no children. Uh, she was Caucasian. She was in her late 60s. And she had no, and they were, uh, she was introducing my father to metaphysics. And so she, he told uh, Joyce, her name was Joyce Carl. He said, Joyce, I have nine kids. You know, I don't know what to do. I, I, I'm all over the place. Yeah, I come from a nine kid family. And so, uh, and there's Michael, he's the youngest boy, and he loves to sing. He's singing in the shower, he's, you know, constantly uh, singing, and I don't know what to do with this guy. She said, give him to me. And so, of course, he gave me to Joyce. Little did I know they made this agreement in the back room back there. So, um, Joyce was responsible, and I love her dearly. Joyce was responsible for taking me from a 14-year-old, uh, five foot 11 or whatever I was, a nose that's too big for his body, all of 140 pounds, and she started to take me to concerts in Los Angeles. And um, she would say, we're gonna go to a concert this evening and I want you to dress a certain way and, and so forth and okay, why? And uh, anytime I would dialogue with her, she would kind of like Dana, she would correct me if I used an <laughs> improper grammar, you know, I mean, you know. Um, and so uh, this budding relationship uh, ultimately culminating with her saying, you know you're going to college. No one else in my family had gone to college, no one, absolutely. I was kind of an athletic gym rat type of guy growing up, so I thought I'd give scholarship and. But Joyce said, you're going to college, and that's it. That's the end of the conversation. And so through her mentorship and her spiritual guidance, I remember once I was there, she became my music mentor as well. Piano lessons, uh, voice lessons, uh, German lessons, Italian lessons, French lessons. Boy, I was ready to pull her hair out before this you know, thing was over with. It was... It was like that, but it was a marvelous experience. And once, once I went to her home, and she gave me a little book and when I left. And this, this, uh, I treasured this book. I had no idea what it meant at the time. It was a small book. I could put it in my pocket and was pretty fat. It was like this, and it was just really thick. And so as I was on the bus, I, it was called the I Am. Right, I'm 14, 15 years old. I Am? What does that mean? Did I know she gave me a magic wand to start working with? I started to read that book, and even though I didn't intellectually comprehend, guess what? I have a soul. Guess what? I have a heart. And that language spoke to both of those things. My intellect wasn't developed, but my heart was always there, and my soul has always been there. And so Joyce and I, she... Um, uh, came to my graduation at UCLA, I graduated from UCLA uh, the first there and went on to get a master's degree and, and so forth. And um, she believed in, in me so strongly and so keenly um, that I've traveled the world because of what she put in me. Uh, and I'm just so grateful for it. So that was my experience. Every time I sing, I give thanks to Joyce. Because she was the one who took me through those scales and she taught me music and she actually put me in the arena with other great artists. And she would embarrass the hell out of me, excuse me, but she would, we would go backstage after a concert, or let's say we, you know, um, 
uh, something was, that came to LA, which were many things, we would go backstage and she said, we're going to go meet the artist, Michael. Oh, okay, fine, we'll go meet the artist. And so she would say, give me your arm. And so I would just put my arm out like this, and she was about, she was literally about four foot eight, four foot eight, I mean, she was like, and very busty, and just German, and she just went, mm. she would throw it up, and I'd put my arm out, and she would grab my arm so hard, and she would just hold up. She said, don't you ever forget, that's how a woman holds your arm, Michael. And so we would walk backstage, and we would meet the artist, and she would say, oh, your performance was awesome. I want you to meet Michael. He's a great singer. I'm like, Ooh. And I just played it off. I just, you know, I just said, okay. Mm-hmm, okay. And we did that every time. And so they would say, oh, well, that's nice. Congratulations. And so all of this started to play on me. And this was Joyce. This is my first experience at this, at this divine love. Lessons of love are kind of are everywhere. Think of that part of the announcement on the uh, airplane when uh, uh, the flight attendant <laughs> uh, says, be sure to put on your oxygen mask before assisting your child. And this is very profound because this is how love works. Or consider, uh, uh, so Gandhi said, I, I, who's one of my favorite mentors, uh, Gandhi said, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and your affection. Wow, you know. But how does one feel worthy of love? How do we apply and incorporate what we know to be true into our daily lives? And so I, I uh, researched it and I found five steps I want to share with you today. If there's anyone, we all can, can of course, feel worthy to love, which is a royal calling for all of us because it requires the most royal behavior of attitude, mind, of intellect, physicality. And so these are things that, that I, I found. First of all, you must believe there is love. You must believe there is love. This is expressing belief and showing faith in something outside of yourself. As good as that is, it is even better to have faith and love as part of yourself. Be in love is a spiritual kind of belief. It holds a love that exists as a universal quality that can never be defeated, only covered over. Love and non-love are not equals. Love is permanent, non-love is temporal. The second step, don't limit love to just a few people and deny others. Oh, I'm so guilty of that. I got to tell you, you know, if you're a singer, I'm going to love you real good. If you're an artist, I'm going to love you real good. Um, I, like I said, I come from a big family. I have five sisters and three brothers. And you would think we came, came, came from all the same parent. We would be the more alike. We just kind of look alike. That's about it. That's the extent of it. Everything, everybody's going their own way. Everybody's discovering things their own way. And I, I've come to realize it's my job as a metaphysician, as a, as a practitioner of new thought, as, as, a, as a steward of new thought, is to bring more love into my family. I'm number six in line, by the way, if you didn't know. So I'm kind of like, not the middle, I'm on the lower end, but, you know, I was tall so I could run with the big kids, and, you know, it was kind of, kind of a strange thing. But don't limit your love to just a few people. Share your love. It is perfectly understandable to say you love your children, your family most. But there is a spiritual teaching going back thousands of years, which says, the world is my family. If love is universal, no one can be left out. To leave others out of your love is the same as inviting them to leave you out. Number three, make the search for love an inward search. Do we know how to, do we know how to look inward? Because that's where those are where the answers are. They're all there. Do we know how to 
do that focus and shine that light inward. Number four, seek other people who value love as much as you do. Well, I see many of you out here tonight, and uh, I'm so glad to see you. You came out to support this talker to be here. Uh, but I'm looking for people who are, when I look at them, I see love. I feel love. I know love at a greater degree, a greater level of understanding, because I'm in their presence. And it's not something you articulate. You just know, and you feel, and if you're smart, you just roll with it. You just like, hmm, this is great. I'm just like, you know, I'm just enjoying this ride. But you think I'm just cool and laying back and just like, you know, but I'm enjoying that love ride. I'm enjoying that love ride. And hopefully my love, my heart, is pouring out into that moment, into that environment. And the fifth step, believe in love as a powerful force. Now this is important for all the, this is the most important one of all the four. We see all around us people who are madly, who madly pursue surrogate love and pleasure, money, and status or compensation when love is absent are too weak to transform their lives. You do not have to give up these things, but it makes a huge difference to know that they are not love. The power of love is that it dissolves non-love. That's the kind of power you find on the spiritual path. Yes, it, it all begins with, with loving yourself. Can you love yourself? How many of you look in the mirror and say, I love you, Michael. Uh, I say that to myself all the time. You know, I, I mean enough time. It's kind of, I'm still not to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm real comfortable with it. But you know, as an artist, you know, most of the time I'm in front, you learn to be exposed and okay, I get used to that. That's what I'm used to. And it's kind of like when you say, uh, you look in the mirror and you say, I love you, Michael, and I smile, but I haven't brushed my teeth yet. So I start judging, I start seeing all these things, but anyway. You didn't comb your hair yet, you know? No, I love you, Michael. So I get past the humanity part of who I am. You gotta realize, you, you gotta, so be, we're all humanity, but we gotta get to that part that's not the human part so much. So I'm gonna invite you all to say, I love you and to state your name tonight. So can we do that? Yeah. So I'm going to say, I love you, Michael. And you can say, I love you. Yeah. Once again, I love you, Michael. Why am I louder than everyone else? <laughs> I'm always loud, I know. I, I got it. You know, one of the things about this teaching, I, I found this teaching at, at I guess about eight years old when I first, my father dragged uh, me and uh, three of my other siblings uh, uh, to Founders Center for Spiritual Living in Los Angeles. And um, my father never did this, you know, and so it was quite surprising when he gathered us up. I felt, you know, we, I was unfortunate that he gathered me as part of the group that was going to church with him that day. And so we all dressed up and my father uh, who was one who was perpetually late to everything. Uh, so we arrived at Founders, and Founders is one of the largest uh, uh, metaphysical centers at this time um, in Los Angeles. And we get there, we, we can't find a parking space, and we find a parking space, and we rush in, and uh, the wonderful deacon who uh, was hosting the, the door we entered in uh, said, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the lower floors are packed. There's no more seating. So you'll have to go to the balcony. And I don't know if you've been to the phone, it's like a circle. You, I've never, it's like three, you get so lost in that place. You know, where, where's left, where's, where's east, west, you know. You lose, I'm part Indian too, so I, I was like, I, I don't know where I am. Anyway, we go up to the balcony and he says, I don't have enough seats for all of you. There's five of, uh, yeah, I can spread you out. So he spread, it, uh, spread us out which I love, because I got to sit right at the lip of the balcony. So of course, at eight years old, I was looking down at people at the top of their head and everything, you know, and, 
it was just, you know, I was just having a great time as a kid. And then all of a sudden, the curtains opened uh, in front. And here stood a choir of about 125 voices. Wow, I never heard anything like that. And then this guy came out, this gentleman came out, and he stood, I didn't know he was from New York City Opera, I mean, and he came, and he stood, and he stood, and he had a stance about him that I was like, who is this guy? And he began to sing, and the choir began to sing. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Little did I know I would be there as a soloist in my early 20s. And I shared that experience with uh, the minister at the time, uh, William H. D. Hornaday, and his secretary. And uh, they said, we're going to write that up, Michael. You know, we're going to put that in our newsletter. And so they wrote me up. And it was a marvelous thing. This is again from Joyce. And um, anyway, so I love this teaching. I've loved it for a long time. And I had to battle through, you know, the holiness, the Baptists, the, you know, all the various things my parents were indulging in. And this, when this came, guess what? My heart, soul, and mind came together with it. And so I love Ernest Holmes. All of that is to say I love Ernest Holmes, okay? That was what that was all about. I love, I call him E.H. So E.H., I have a few quotes from E.H., is what I call him. And he says, love is a healing power touching everything into wholeness, healing the wounds of experiences with this divine bond. Today, I be, bestow the essence of love upon everything. He's like a, he's like Dumbledore for something, man. This guy, he's just like, I'm bestowing love, and you can just see him going, and all this tickly stuff coming out of his fingers. I know that this love essence is the very substance of life, the creative principle behind everything, flowing through my whole being, spiritual, emotional, Mental, physical. Come on, E.H., come on, man, you're talking now. Love is the grandest healing and drawing power on earth. It is the very reason for our being. There is but one ultimate impulsion in the universe. This impulsion is love. It is the pure essence of divine givingness. I learned early on that whatever you love in life, that's what you're obligated to give. I said, I love checks. I love getting checks in the mail. Well, guess what, Michael? You need to write more checks so you can get more checks in the mail. You want to uh, have a better humor, you need to be more humorous. You want to have a lightness of spirit, uh, you, need to, you need to be that. And Gandhi said it also that, be that which you wish to see in the world. Ernest goes on. There is but one ultimate impulsion in the universe. This impulsion is love. It is pure essence of divine giving. I think I read that. Right. Love harmonizes everything. Oh, you know I love that. Harmonizes everything. One of the greatest thrills I've had is to sing with other talented singers and when we hit a harmony, I would feel like I'm, I'm soaring into heaven or the celestial realm. So I love that thing. And then Ernest also says, I believe love is the greatest healing. Healing. I believe in healing. I got to tell you, folks, we need to do more healing in our centers. It's not, I believe in healing. I think that's a tool we all can manifest through love. But I, uh, I believe love is the greatest healing, motivating power in the universe. Because love is giving this. I only love can be the love fulfilled, uh, a love fulfilled itself in your experience. Because love harmonizes everything, unifies everything. It gives to everything, flows through everything. That's the beauty of, of metaphysics, and that's opened up my world, is that it's in everything. It's everywhere at all times. No matter where you are, whatever you're, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're doing, whatever environment you're in, whatever disposition you may, it's always there. It's always there. It's, it's never not there. All you have to do is uh, be the consciousness of it. You just have to tweak that mind, that computer mind that we need, 
Uh, and this expression, we just get in there and tweak it. I want to focus on love. I want to see more love. The message shared here is this. We are love. The most powerful force in the universe is ours. It is ours to express and most importantly, to bring to this planet. This planet. Have any of you taken a look at the solar system or the universe or on a beautiful night? We are on occasions uh, are find ourselves in Idaho, which, which, which is not a big city, and the stars that come out in the evening are mesmerizing. And I say, I said today, we're a part of all that vastness. Do you get that we're made up of the essence of all of that? Uh, how powerful that is? Can you, can you even wrap yourself around that? Or, or, this is what I'm saying, are you feel worthy? to even actually believe that we are a part of that expression? And we are. You know, there's a saying, uh, uh, a drop from the ocean is not all of the ocean, but it contains all of the essence of the ocean in one drop. Another one of my metaphysical teachers is uh, Deepak Chopra, and he said, love is part of creation, woven into the very fabric of the universe. We love one another because we have tapped into nature at a deeper level. Yet ultimately, love comes from the soul. The soul. I gave you those three words. Heart, soul, and mind. Many of you probably never experienced this, but when I, when I travel in, in foreign countries, I know people know I'm a tourist when they call me soul brother. <laughs> I'm walking around and somebody say, soul, hey soul brother. I'm like, oh man, okay, he knows I'm a tourist. I'm like totally looking tourist to this guy. But you know, that's a, that's a really cool thing to say to someone, you know, that you are soul. Because soul is that which has always been, always will be, and forever will be who we are. And so then Gandhi, um, uh, uh, through the heart, we may come to know the love of God. Through the heart, we may become the love of God. You know, what's so, so interesting, I, 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 I thought of this, and, then, and I said, you know, uh, you all are familiar with the, the uh, uh, sacred uh, uh, term that says, uh, God is love. God is love. So, so, and love is God. God is love, and love is God. So, as I express love, I'm like God. I'm in God realm. It's like, wait, I haven't smoked any cannabis or anything. I'm telling you, this is, this is just, this is my spirit time. This is be joy. Be joy is the spirit essence of me. And so, anyway. So anyway, that's, that was a profound thing that, that so I flip that around. So in a, when I read things that has God, I put in love, no matter what it is. So God is directing my path today. Well, love is directing my path today. So anywhere this God says, God is love and love in God. You know, I'm not a great mathematician, but if Einstein was here, I said, Einstein, is that true? If love is God and God is love, are they the same? He said, that's a very good question, Michael. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. And then, of course, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 13 uh, in the Bible. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Catherine Ponder goes on. I love her, her work. Um, whatever your need is in life, whatever your need in life, may, what it is may be, Whatever your need in life may be, love is the answer. Roger Teal, marvelous ministry up in, in uh, Colorado. If you want to know love, you must allow the armor of fear to be stripped piece by piece until you are naked before the world. He knows about vulnerability here. That's a good one. You know, Marianne Williamson, 
um, you know, return to the, to the heart of love. Love is what we are born with. Fear is what we learn. The spiritual journey is the unlearning of fear and prejudices and the acceptance of love back in our hearts. Love is the essential reality. You know, when I went to college, I found a, a real interesting educational axiom. And it's not like I'm educating you, I'm uneducating you to all the things that you thought were the truth. I'm getting you to release those things that are not true, that you think are, that you are believing are true. So we have to get rid of those before we start layering with a real education for you. So education is stripping, like Roger says, stripping piece by piece those things we believe to be the truth of who we are, or the truth of reality, or the truth of that. We strip those, and then we begin the foundation of the things that are actually true. Um, and there are countless more examples of this. Um, I want to kind of some, uh, conclude uh, with sharing a little bit about uh, the person that demonstrated the, the love for, for me. Um, you know, um, I think we all have stories, all of us to tell. We all have interesting stories and that are profound. And uh, this one I'm going to share with you. It's one of the stories I have. And it's about uh, my mother, who was from Guadalajara, Mexico. My father had gone uh, to Mexico and enrolled at the University of Mexico to study art and language. And he was actually trying to avoid World War II at the time. And so he was um, there, rented a uh, an apartment for my mother's cousin. And um, they actually met at a party. And, uh, uh, he married her and who was, I don't know how they hooked up because my father was like Rico Suave. Mm -hmm. There was a song that came out as a Rico Suave. Uh, and, and that was my father. He's like all of like, you know, yeah, you know, it's all cool. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. And my mother's like, Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't think so. And, Somehow they got together, and, and I, you know, nine kids later, what can I say, right? <laughs> um, and so he brought her to the States. Um, she had very little education. Um, she was beautiful. What the, the education she had was that she was a spiritual dynamo, a spiritual dynamo. And uh, my mother was well, maybe five feet. So I got a thing for small women, short women. Right? <laughs> Between her and Joyce, what can I say, you know, just kind of, anyway, so my mother came and, you know, they had, you know, nine kids and, and my father uh, perpetually was struggling. So I like when um, we talk about prosperity and actualization and realization, prosperity in our expression, because I come from a place that wasn't, that wasn't a belief system. And um, so my mother struggled, my father struggled, everything was difficult. But what we know we had in that home was a lot of love, you know. And my brothers and us, my mother, I never, we never cursed in our home. Ooh, never, 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 never. Somebody, I got hit in the eye with an apple one time. Bam! My brother was mad at me. He threw an apple at me, and he didn't think he was going to hit me. He's not that good a pitcher. And for some reason, he caught me. I was looking out the side here, and bam! But then I throw a skillet at him, and we just, you know. And that's how we used to, you know, settle arguments in, our, in, in my house. So we knew who not to mess with and who uh, was a touchy, uh, you know, temper and everything. But mom, she was great. She, she kept us all survival ready, let me just say. <laughs> and so we all grew up. We all are adults and we all grew up. No one was uh, taken in. We were in a very violent environment. Uh, many people I knew who, who were, I've been... Uh, in the drug world and, 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 the, and the gang banging world and, and all those things, I hate to just say this, like, oh, not another gang banging story. But I'm, I'm just saying, my mother, she would tell me, uh, I was very industrious. I started selling newspapers and shiny shoes with my older brothers at four years old. So I was tagging along. And he said, Michael, if you, you know, if you do something, we're, gonna, we're sending you back. 
Or one brother, he would just hit me and give me a Charlie horse on the legs. Don't do that again. Okay, okay. And so I'm walking like this for the next hour. And, um, which was great because we came in, a, it was a tough neighbor. So my mother always told me, okay, Michael, you're going outside. I want you to know in Espanol, she's talking in Spanish. So, okay, mom, God is watching you. No matter what you do, God is watching you. Oh, she, mom, why do you say that? Mom, come on. I'm a young guy. I'm, you know, I like to have fun. I'm adventurous. I'm mischievous. I didn't say this, but this, oh, mom, come on. And that, you know what that did? Man, some of my friends are doing stuff, and I said, Mom, my mom said, God's watching me, man. So I can't, you guys go, I'll see you guys later. I'll see you guys when you get done with that. I'll see you guys, you know. And I was running with a pack of like, we would have made uh, the little guy, the Oliver Twist, who's the guy from England with the little gang, and you know, they were doing everything under the sun. And I ran around with some of the hardest kids in my neighborhood, you know. And, but there was a point, and then because my mom, but I didn't realize what she was saying also, that God is watching you. Love is watching you. Oh, okay. Love is watching you. So that's what I would say now. Love is watching you. So my mother taught me that, and she was always on her knees, always praying, always uh, giving thanks for each day, and she was the rock of our of our family. And she, she made some pretty good Mexican food too, by the way. Uh, and my father was African-American. And um, so it was kind of, it was interesting dynamics, although I didn't think much of it at that time, you know? Um, and um, so anyway, I, I'm so grateful to have had that experience. It taught me a lot about race and, and bicultural relationships uh, uh, that we now have a lot of trouble with in this country. <laughs> I'm like, what's the problem? You know, it's like, come on, you know, we can all get together. You know, there's no problem. Anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Um, my last and in concluding, I'd like to do a um, meditation on love with you. Uh, if we can, uh, for, for a minute or so, if you can uh, get comfortable, um, whatever that means to you. And uh, I would ask that you Embrace a deep breath to open up the portals. I call it, well, it's actually the chakras, I believe the portals of the chakra, but the heart chakra in particular, which is right seated in the middle of all the chakras, it's right here. It's the color blue, in fact. Blue represents the heart chakra, and it sits right here. So anytime you want to feel more hard in, in, in whatever you're experiencing, just put your hand on your heart. And, and if you feel nervous, um, you're in an environment where you may not feel, just put your hand right here, it works every time. So we just take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Oh.
whenever you, whenever you just so desire, just breathe out. Breathe back into uh, this place. I use OM because that's the uh, universal sound of the universe, apparently. And um, it really hits right in my core heart place. Well, in closing, just a couple of things I want to leave with you. One is that I've learned that the most amazing and important thing in my life is an open heart that's full of love. An open heart that's full of love. And I'd like to share with you, in closing, this song that, that really depicts that.
Thank you, thank you. Wow, another round of applause for Michael Paul Smith. That was so beautiful. We've been basking in the Thank you. Can't wait to be